to the Journey Shake Cam. Well, today we have some more dot diagrams to draw. I know how much fun they are, because we played with balloons to figure them out. So you do them to the best of your ability, and we'll talk about them in a moment. In 1A, we have the nitrite ion, and the nitrite ion has a negative one charge. So nitrogen has five electrons, and then it gained one from the charge. This negative one is my charge on the nitrogen, and I add that to the central atom, and I show it as a negative so that I know that I took care of that. Now I'm going to move this ox dot over here and I'm going to add my oxygen here, and oxygen has six electrons, and this oxygen has six electrons. And in order for the nitrogen to get an octet, I needed to have one double bond. And therefore, now I have eight electrons around my nitrogen, eight around my two oxygens, and when I draw it as a line structure, I see very clearly that I have a lone pair and I have two bond pairs. And when I have a charged particle, I always put it in brackets and show the negative one charge. Now this is bent one because it has one lone pair and it is 117 degrees. And because of this lone pair, it is also polar, meaning that it's very negative on this side and relatively more positive on the other side. So it is a polar molecule. Now the shapes that follow the octet rule, if they have a lone pair or an unshared pair, then they're always polar. In B, I have selenium, which has six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And each oxygen has six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I first do not bond as a double bond. I'm going to do that at the last when I see that I am going to need two more electrons to make it an octet. And so I will put these two to double bond. And then I have eight electrons around my selenium and eight around each oxygen. And when I look at the line structure, I see that I have a double bonded oxygen. Oops, that's not oxygen, it's selenium. Selenium in the middle and then my two oxygens. This is trigonal planar. It is a trigonal planar shape and it is nonpolar because all of the oxygens are equally distant apart from each other and they're pulling equally on those electrons. Therefore, it is a nonpolar molecule. And the angle is 120 degrees. That's A and B and I'll be right back. In number 1C, we have carbon in the middle. And carbon has four outer valence electrons. One, two, three, four. And hydrogen also has one. And then chlorine has seven. And each chlorine wants one more. And there we have it. We have one available for each chlorine. And when I circle the octets, I can see that I have my octet around the carbon, 
and chlorine has octets, and hydrogen is happy with a duet. Now, when I draw the line structure, it looks like it is like it is a square. However, in reality, this molecule is a tetrahedron, and we have the molecule or the atoms of the chlorine are on three sides of this molecule, and the hydrogen is on one side. They're not opposite of each other. You can turn this any way, and they are not opposite each other. But three of them are chlorine, so they're very electronegative on that chlorine side, pulling for those electrons. And the hydrogen is relatively positive in comparison. And therefore, this molecule is polar. Here is another representation that we have of this one. And you can see that the molecule, the atoms, are not opposite of each other. It's very important to understand this three-dimensionally because the two-dimension really gives it an idea that one is on top and one is on bottom and clearly that's not the case. Can you see it? You got to take a look at it because you need to understand this. So, tetrahedral. Now, it is 109.5 degrees. The second one is a carbon chain, and therefore the carbons are hooked together. Carbon has four dots, and this carbon also has four dots, and the hydrogens each have one dot. And therefore, we now have the octahedron, around, uh, uh, not an octahedron, not an octahedron, an octet around each carbon, and we have a duet around each hydrogen. Almost fooled you there, didn't I? I had a chlorine there, and that's supposed to be a carbon, but we have a C together. There you have it. Now, when I draw this as a line diagram, I see that the carbons are attached, and the hydrogens are split between the two carbons. And in order to determine the shape, what I do is I cover up and I look at only one carbon. And carbon, therefore, has four bond pairs and no lone pairs, which also makes it a tetrahedral, 109.5 degrees. And because everything around this is non, it's all the same all the way around, that it is nonpolar. Most carbon compounds are nonpolar when we get long chains of carbons. And this is also nonpolar. Number two asks for us to draw the resonance structures for the nitrate ion. Well, first of all, I need to write down what is the nitrate ion. Then I want to draw my dot diagram to figure out what the shape looks like. Nitrogen has five dots. And I gained one, and I add that as a negative. Oxygen has six. And this oxygen has six. And notice that now it doesn't matter where which electrons go because they're all the same. All electrons are identical. I just do the little X and O so I know where they came from. I'm organized that way. I like to see it. So now I have these eight around this nitrogen, eight around the oxygen, eight around this oxygen, and eight around this oxygen. Therefore, I can see that I have one double bond. And anytime I have a double bond, resonance is possible. The way that I'm going to draw this is here is my oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, and oxygen. And whenever I have a charged particle, I have to show that I took care of that charge by putting it outside of the brackets. Now I have another diagram that would have been just as accurate and just as valid by changing the location of that double bond. And I have one more structure that I could draw, and it is this one. 
all three of these diagrams are equally true about the nitrate ion. All of them would be correct. And therefore, they are resonance structures. And the actual molecule is an average of these three diagrams because this is a two-dimensional model that we are using to see what it looks like. It is trigonal planar, and the double bond could be in any of these three positions. But the actual molecule is not a double bond and two single bonds. It is like a one and a half, one and a third bond. And therefore, it's not like this because this is just what our model comes up with. Now get ready to take some notes because we're going to take notes in a moment about benzene. The structure of benzene is very important because there are many similarities of many of our organic compounds. Benzene is C6H6. Now take a moment and watch how we can draw this. There are six carbons. And each carbon has four electrons. One, two, three, four. And then the next carbon also has four electrons. One, two, three, four. And then we have four more. One, two, three, four. And then we have four more. One, two, three, four. And four. One, two, three, four. And one, two, three, and four. Now on each site, I'm going to have a hydrogen coming off as well. So I have a hydrogen here, and a hydrogen here, and a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. You'll notice here that I have eight electrons, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. We love the octet. And two, four, six, eight. And then the last carbon also has an octet. And each hydrogen has a duet. And you need to try to draw that for yourself. It seems a little bit complicated, but it's not really that bad. And when we have this arrangement, actually it is, you can see, you have an alternating double single bond, double single bond alternating. Therefore, we could draw it like this. and then the hydrogens coming off of each carbon. And this is the way that it looks. Now you're going to see, it's just crazy what happens to those electrons. Now we show these, an abbreviated way of showing a structure that is similar to this would be this. This is called a ring or aromatic structure, a ring or an aromatic structure. And it looks very complicated, but once you try it once, you'll be fine with it. Now, we need to talk about where the electrons are in this model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this. And I'm going to draw the p orbitals that are on each carbon has a p orbital that is parallel. The p orbitals are parallel. And when we have parallel p orbitals, what happens is the electrons begin to flow around the top, around and around the top. And then they also flow around the bottom, 
around and around the bottom. And we get like two donuts, one above and one below these P orbitals. And when we have this arrangement where we have this ring forming around these parallel P orbitals, we call them pi bonds. Pi bonds. Pi, just like in math, the pi symbol. And when we have parallel P orbitals, we have these pi bonds. And I suggest you look for benzene in one of your textbooks so that you can see a picture of these, of these shapes. Any chemistry textbook will show you one of these shapes. And I'm sure that when you were taking notes or outlining some area that had the terms that I was looking for, then you would have seen the benzene structure. And what's critical about benzene is not only is it a ring structure, but it has delocalized pi electrons. Delocalized pi electrons. Very important is that these electrons are delocalized. Now I'll talk to you about another type of orbital in just a moment. Now a very important point is all these models and shapes that we've been drawing and the balloons that we did were especially showing about how chemistry is all about attractions and repulsions. That's what chemistry is, attractions and repulsions. And the model that we have been using to get these shapes is called the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. That's the model that we have been using. And of course we have an abbreviation for this, V-S-E-P-R. And we pronounce it a variety of different ways. I just say Vesper. It's a Vesper model. And that's what all of these bonding structures that we've been doing are based on the repulsions of the electron pairs. That's the model that we're using. Now, we have different orbitals, and now the orbitals are blending in these carbon compounds and some of the other, comp well, other compounds, we have a blending of the orbitals. And therefore, that's how we got the pi bonding, was through the blending of those parallel p orbitals. Now, the basic kind of orbital blending is called sigma bonding. Sigma bonding. Sigma. Now, sigma, as well as the pi, they're Greek letters. And it's a funny letter. It looks kind of like that, but I'm not very good at drawing it. I'm sure you can find it in a textbook. Now, sigma bonds occur when you have two s orbitals that are blending. And in here, this is where the sigma is. So we have two s orbitals. That is one way to find a sigma bond. Another way is if we have an s orbital and a p orbital, and then we have a sigma bond between them as they blend. So we have one s and one p orbital that are blending. And finally, we have a possibility of two p orbitals that are end to end. Here is where I have a sigma bond. Two p orbitals end to end. That's very important because remember the pi bond was when the p orbitals were parallel. Now the p orbitals are end to end and that gives me a sigma bond. And those are the three orbital arrangements that can give me a sigma bond. Now we just have a little bit more to go. We need to talk about some saturated and unsaturated fats. When we have a long chain of carbons, we have carbon, 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 and we have some double bond here, and then I have a triple bond. Well, carbon can only have four bonds. Therefore, I can put a hydrogen, 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 one, two, three, 
hydrogen, one, two, three, four, and four, and four, and then one, two, three, four. And therefore, I can only put another hydrogen on the end. When we have double and triple bonds inside of one of these carbon chains, it's called unsaturated. It is unsaturated. Now, oftentimes, these unsaturated molecules are fats. And unsaturated fats are liquids at room temperature. And the vegetable oils, and they're much more healthy for us vegetable oils, unsaturated fats. And what happens here, when I break all these double and triple bonds, I can saturate it with hydrogens. But before I do that, I also want to count up how many sigma and pi bonds are in this compound. Well, every bond has a sigma bond. So you just count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 sigma bonds. This compound has 14 sigma bonds. There is one pi bond in a double bond and two pi's in a triple bond. Therefore, I have one, two, three, four pi bonds in this compound. And that's how you do that. And you'll see some structures and you'll have to determine the number of sigma bonds and the number of pi bonds. That's not too bad. Now, let's take this saturated compound and saturate it. We're going to knock out all of these double and triple bonds, and we're going to hook it up with our hydrogens, as many as we can. Now, it is called a saturated compound. It is a saturated fat. And saturated fats are solids at room temperature which is why they're not so good for us because they clog up our arteries sometimes if we have too many of them. So this is a saturated fat. Now, how I went from the unsaturated to the saturated was I partially hydrogenated it. I partially added hydrogens because it had some hydrogens, but it wasn't completely full as many hydrogens as it could possibly hold. I had to break those bonds and add those hydrogens, and now I have a partially hydrogenated fat. And that's how that happens. So there you have it. We talked about the Vesper theory and benzene and the delocalized electrons and sigma bonds and pi bonds. And we saw how ring structures, ring structures are very, very important. We have them in, our, in hormones and in the smells, pineapple and wintergreen and all the things we love to smell are oftentimes have aromatic structures and are steroids, all kinds of different compounds that are in our bodies are ring structures. So it's very common. So we need to be familiar with that, at least the beginnings of it. So when someone talks to you about it, you have some idea. Well, that was some fun and we sure learned a lot today. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Bye.